Very good morning to you all. Welcome to Sunrise Daily today. I'm Chamberlain Oso. I'm Ayo Makine. Welcome to the show. From Abuja, I'm Maupe Ogu Yusuf. Yeah, so today, uh, yeah, we'll have uh, Lillian Ilo, who is a former senior editor with The Guardian Newspapers, as we get into the dailies. Good morning and thank you for coming. Good morning. Nice to be here. All right, so let's start with leadership. They are following up with what transpired yesterday, which, uh, well, might have been a bit of a surprise to those who may not have you know, paid close attention to it. But for those who were, having listened to the former president, Good Luck Jonathan, giving the briefing to the president, going back and forth. Look at the big lead on the front page of leadership today. Who echoes suspends Mali, asks member states to close borders as Keita cabinet members resign to stave off bloodshed colonel goita declares self head of junta nigeria un us wants detained politicians released tell soldiers to return to barracks this will remind you of some days of what transpired in this country <laughs> in history exactly but now it's still happening here and there are people jubilating as a matter of fact yes because uh you know they've been the uh, against the leadership of Mali for a while. The people are the ones that really matter here, but you know, the laws have to take, uh, they have to be affected. International laws, the UN has, has condemned it, the African um, Union as well, and then ECOWAS. I, I mean, it's because they see it as barbaric anyway. Mm. Times are changing in the political scene. But isn't, isn't it funny? Just as you said, you said it's the people that matter. The people matter. On the one hand, the people were jubilating that it's happened. Of course. On the other hand, the international community is against it. So where's the interest of the people here? There has to be a balance. I guess they, they felt there is a better way. But there's no other way other than like a revolution. You hear people call for revolutions in nations where the leaders are not meeting up with the with, with the with the aspirations of the masses so this is a signal to nations where you have leaders that would not like to listen to the people mm -hmm. democracy is a government for the people well it's happening again in africa the soldiers so already said they will do the put the transition but that's what they all say <coughs> <laughs> whenever they take over like that they will tell you, tell you we will put in place certain things but there'll be pressures on them definitely. yeah ECOWAS and AU because right. they've closed the borders all the sanctions we've right. definitely forced them to do something they can't operate effectively without okay without sanctions i guess there's this other one 2021 budget senate threatens 50 agencies with zero allocation summons ministers others and you just say, look, well, did they ever make good this threat? Well, <laughs> I guess so. Okay, but look at this. Analysts predict further devaluation as Naira drops to 480 Naira to the dollar. So That is really, really, really ridiculous. How <laughs> can the Naira? In South Africa, it is not that bad. It's only in Nigeria that you get this kind of ridiculous exchange rate. It's really, really bad. Something has to be done. It's wow. affected the economy too badly, so badly. But what then can be done that hasn't been done? I mean, uh, there are these one, this particular devaluation has its roots in the, in the 80s during the military government of Abuja. I guess some people must be benefiting because I don't know. Some people right. must be benefiting. <laughs> there are so many currency traders all around. It's only in Nigeria. It's like Nigerians, even the political elites, they, 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 are, they take pride in vanishing dollars, even at events. They like to spend the dollar is as against Naira. But Nigerians too, is it just the elites now? Well, it's the elites that have access to the dollar. You <laughs> okay. will find the poor masses with dollars. They don't even have enough Naira to spend. <laughs> that is it. Well, the Daily Trust newspaper this morning says, well, it leads with this one. Boko Haram fighters kill soldiers, abduct 100 in Borno. Farmers, fishermen pay tax to access farms and rivers. 
Terrorists attack Magomere, kill nursing mother, destroy hospital. Military kills 20 terrorists in airstrikes. And there is a uh, quote there, why insecurity persists. That story is on page 5. On the one hand, we hear technical defeat. On the other hand, we hear it's banditry and not Boko Haram. There is a general word, insurgency, terrorism. All of this is just like some potpourri that we don't seem to understand. It's an unending war. I don't know when it's going to end. It's really, really sad. Even the president admitted recently, you know, to the fact that it's becoming so worrisome. When he summoned the service chiefs, you remember, yeah. recently? It, because there has been pressure from the masses, from even the legislature, as to whether it was worthy to be keeping these service chiefs. At, uh, initially, people were like, oh, no, why? Some people, you see some people say, arguing oh, against it. But the president had to succumb in a way, admitted that they were not doing well. He admitted it, that they were not doing well. Yes. Uh, yes, they had to live up to expectations. So I don't know. I think it's all about, I don't know. I don't know. Well, the Daily Trust newspaper has other stories. Mamandara in UK for medical attention. Edo APC PDP trade blame. As Amnesty raises alarm over violence. I'm, I'm wondering, a number of people are also very, very concerned about what's going to happen in Edo State. Are you? Very worried indeed. Any normal person will be worried. The fight is really, really terrible. They're talking about um, uh, hate speech, but the, most of the hate speeches come from the politicians. You hear people are calling a human being pig, snail. They are the ones that are guilty of the hate speech. Hate speeches. Yet, they tell you, oh, hate speech, we are increasing the, the fee. You know. Okay. Well, this so one much also. tension in Edo. Yeah, this one also from uh, the front page on the bottom strip, right under the picture there. Wask seven student test positive for COVID nineteen in Gombe. That is terrible. And uh, we saw how one of them had to be taken to a, a corner to be writing his exam. How can a sick person be writing exams? And now the number has increased. I don't know. It's really really sad. Well, that's the Daily Trust newspaper this morning. Mark The Nigerian Tribune for you. The Nigerian Tribune has this on its front page. Why the North must be saved. That's according to the ACF chairman. Uh, page 30 is where you find details. It says, once government's involvement in federal government's 75 billion naira loan to farmers, education, security. So a number of problems, it will seem, confronting the northern parts of the country. Topmost is security, which has affected a lot of farmers uh, who are unable to go to their farms. Um, what do you make of the security situation in the northern part of Nigeria? And, uh, and this statement from the ACF chairman uh, talking about why the north must be saved. The situation, the security situation, as I said earlier, is really, really bad. It's in top, really bad shape. I don't know how they're going to sort, sort it out. It's really, really bad. I guess they have to change their tactics because if you're using, keep using the same tactics and it's not working, I mean, you have to change your tactics. Mm. Now that uh, the ACF chairman is saying that they want federal government involvement in 75 billion naira loan to farmers in education and security, what end do you think that's supposed to achieve? Well, it's going to boost the farmers' uh, output. By the time they pump money into the, the, that sector, of course, it's going to boost the outcome, the output of the farmers. Okay, let's look at other stories here. IGP deploys detectives in Oyo, orders rearrest of suspected Ibadan serial killer. Youths attack police headquarters in Ibadan. Uh, we saw that story of how a serial killer was able to escape, and now the IGP has ordered his rearrest. Um, 
what are your thoughts on how that was able to transpire in Ibadan? I don't really know. It's so disappointing. How could somebody that is arrest, you know, in, in, on, inside the custody, you know, supposed to be in the post, for police custody, escape? And we learned, I think, a certain policeman came that was not on duty, came in that day and then disappeared. It just tells us about the inefficiency of our security agents. I think something happened again in Edakwara after this now. How can a 19-year-old boy, serial killer, escape the police just like that? It's, it's the, the security of the machinery in this country is too porous. It's just too porous. Mm. But I'm sure that, you know, the police must be embarrassed about, you know, how that has happened. Looking at, you know, other stories we find here, something also concerning elections and the police. On the local government election, well, this is just local government election. You see, police to deploy 5,000 personnel. Uh, is this uh, an inkling of what is to come for the governorship polls that will be coming up in Ondo and uh, Edo later on this year? 5,000 personnel is a pretty drastic uh, drawdown from the figures we've seen before. Normally, we see about 30,000 policemen being deployed to a state. Now, it would seem that they are holding local government elections and we're seeing 5,000 personnel. Are these the sort of figures we should be looking to see as the polls approach? I guess uh, this government, they are particularly more interested in issues that are related to politics. They will do anything when, it's politi uh, when it has to do with politics. As against somebody escaped from the police station. Nobody saw him with all the police officers there. But now it's politics because they, they want to defend their... They're supposed to be defending the votes of the masses. But some of these uh, moves is just for their own selfish ends. Mm. It's, it's well, let's leave it there for Ondo local government elections. Let's see how eventually the polls go. I mean, if they go the same way we have always seen local government elections go. Uh, you also see the Asu Adamant as acting unilag like VC assumes duties. State government's not doing enough on flood, that's according to NIMET. Um, is that of concern to you, the fact that state governments should actually brace up uh, as NIMET continues to warn that we could face potential flooding even as the rainy season, uh, you know, is heading towards peak period? What are your thoughts on that? Oh, yes, it's good that the VC is, uh, is uh, resuming uh, duty at the Unilag. Though there is, it's being criticized by the Senate that already came out to be uh, saying that the, 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 the VC that was suspended was unlawfully done. So it's a good thing that the VC is resuming. Is resuming. Okay, All right, let's move on to the next one, which is the Vanguard newspaper today. Insecurity, FG failed, says Papal Nuncio, ACF laments. Life in Nigeria's tough. Okay, well, I think it's going back in history now. Life in Nigeria's tough as in civil war. Okay, life in Nigeria is as tough as it was in civil war. That's what that's I say. Right? That's ascribed to the ACF. Once Northern leaders against inflammatory statements. Government not securing Nigerians. That's Papa Nuncio. Says there's too much violence in Nigeria. Scores of civilians, insurgents, security men feared dead in Boko Haram attack on Kukawa, Borno State. So clearly um, still grappling with this challenge and trying to see what can do about security. Yeah, the security situation is really, really bad. And that happens to be one of the three cardinal points that the, the, this present government assured, you know, um, told the, the, the country that they were going to look into security. They criticized the former government that they were going to take care of the security. It's worsened drastically. Security situation in this country has really, really worsened.
Okay, well, just uh, to drop this one in reps, formerly right, Malami Ahmed on Chinese loans, so you just know that. But look at this one as well. Businesses hail Kama 2020 as pastors howl in protest. There's a lot of riders now. Uh, let's go through them. Helps ease of doing business. That's from Nasima. Good for business, bad for NGOs. LCCI. It will scare investors, shareholders. CAC get on due powers, that's from lawyers, Oyedepo rejects Kama, says no one can appoint a trustee over his church. Government shouldn't suffocate religious bodies, NGOs, says Catholic Bishop of Lagos, and then we're studying the matter, Lagos PFN, you can't shut my bank account, get trustees for me, Primate Ayodele. So, wow, several responses as to this Kama. What do you think of it? Really, really bad. The religious uh, leaders, they, some of them are so vibrant about their stance of uh, control. They, they're trying to t tell the authorities that they, they ought not to be controlled. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, the control is all about keeping you uh, safe, keeping you alive. Talking about the, the COVID-19. Precautions. Okay, take a look at what's on the back page of Vanguard Sports. AFCON 2020 Eagles play Sierra Leone November 9. Uh, then, in case you watched or missed the match yesterday, Nabri Lewandowski take Bayern to final. That's uh, Bayern 3, Leon 0, and they have several other stories. So, that's Vanguard this morning. And uh, the Guardian newspaper also leads with a security story. National security is threatened as 8.4 billion naira scanner project stalls uh, we're not hearing this for the first time sadly um customs resort to 100 percent physical examination ease of doing business suffers total collapse stakeholders lament influx of illicit arms and drugs now uh i think the scanner story is very interesting there because uh, for a while now for so many years now the seaports have been operating manually and that's very dangerous the ease of doing business in, in Nigeria is highly threatened by that they ought to the the, the approver for the scanner i think eight point something billion, 8 billion. yes was uh, it's been proposed by the nigerian customs and up to now it's not been approved and that is like i said they keep you have to approve the essentials, the important things, rather than, you know, you, you, you have to look into this one because when many industrialists have already moved to neighboring countries like Ghana and elsewhere where the enabling environment is very okay. So when, how can Nigeria cost with all the revenue that is accruing from that sector? I don't think I don't see why this cannot be approved, you know, in haste. The scanners mm. and it will cause an influx of uh, weapons, mm. illegal weapons, all the illegal drugs that we talk about, Ramadan and all that. They're being, you know, smuggled into the country. If they don't have the right machinery, the right tools to work, so many things will go wrong. So it's very important that I think the government should address that. Budget. Fast, yes. Well, the story right under the uh, picture you see there, ECOWAS imposes economic diplomatic sanctions on Mali. Junta unveils ruling council decisions as international community deplores coup. Story continues on page six. But right beside the picture, a couple of stories. Students march for reopening of tertiary institutions, vow to ground economy. Do they have a stand here? I think they do to an extent they do because like they said the aviation industry has just been uh, proposed to be open from 29th every other sector has opened the churches have opened and these students go to church they will be some of them can travel on holidays so what you are restricting them from their main interest which is education mm. but some most of those places that are open they are open skeletally and not fully so 
Well, thank God. Uh, yes, but you know, skeletally, like the exit classes now, mm. I have been asked to go back to school. But the tertiary institutions, they should also be allowed. Even, I don't know how they're going to affect the skeletal <laughs> ap approach to that. Okay. Uh -huh. All right, that's the Guardian newspaper this morning. Papa. Well, let's see if we can quickly run through News Direct for you. Uh, Nigerian News Direct has this one. IG deploys detectives to rearrest serial killer in Oyo. I think we're ready to take a look at that story. Protesters attack police. That story is there. We don't pay salary to non-staff. That's according to NDDC. It looks like they've come under some fire again. And then you also see there, uh, AGF cautions MDAs against violating provision of financial regulations. So that is also there on top of the nameplate. At the bottom, NCC Boss Dambata receives distinguished award from ATCON and uh, EFCC charges banks on enhanced collaboration. Um, I don't know what you make of this particular story. EFCC charging banks on enhanced collaboration. A lot of the fraud uh, that anyone will want to commit oftentimes perhaps might be perpetrated through the banks uh, for EFCC to be saying this. Um, I don't know. What do you make of uh, you know the, the cases of fraud we have been seeing in recent times and the successes being recorded by the um, anti-graft agencies by anti-graft I also also taking into cognizance the ICPC and of course the EFCC as well as the primary uh, one charged with prosecuting fraud do you think that we've made a lot of progress I do not think so uh, I don't think we have made a lot of progress in that area but it's a welcome um, I think they should um, continue to put their surveillance on these banks and, uh, but I don't think they have, we've made a, a lot of progress on that. What do you say? We haven't seen too many cases yet. The, many things are still moving around. <laughs> I don't think we've made a lot of, uh, enough uh, progress on that. Or what do you think? Oh, well, <laughs> it's your opinion at this <laughs> no, point. No, you, because you like you were surprised that. Oh, yeah. that so if, you, if if you, you say think they have made progress, if you say they haven't, <laughs> you know, made progress, and perhaps you had certain expectations. That's what I mean. We haven't had of too many arrests, and I know that this country is quite a corrupt country. So many things are moving on that track. We haven't seen too many arrests. I don't, no think, much. I don't think many people will agree with you that the country is very corrupt. Maybe we'll have a number of corrupt people, but not everybody <laughs> Somebody is Somebody once said it's this Nigeria, it's uh, fantastically. Was that the word used? <laughs> Sometimes we go for it. It doesn't mean that, that we should take it. Take it no, we, know, and we know that it's a corrupt Every nation. country have got challenges. Every sector the of, this, of this country. Even the common man, the poor, is even corrupt. Everyone is corrupt. We well, pray that something will well, happen. We're not sure we can make such categorical statements and paint <laughs> this, everybody in one brush. Uh, the average <laughs> is what we're talking about here. <laughs> well, uh, okay, I think we can take a look at Daily Times now. Praise criticism as Nigerians debate karma that we already highlighted. But Labour, NLC berates military over alleged move to silence critics okay so um there's been this back and forth now but this is coming from uh, nlc and then there's military involved and so is this what you think is going is happening planning to silence critics i don't think so why would why would they want to silence critics in a way if you look at the the information minister's uh, comments recently you you can say that uh, there is a slight move towards the direction. You know, he's talking about... Well, I think this has to do, a part of it is talking about um, okay. uh, the NLC, the president of NLC was saying that the statement purportedly uh, issued by the military's high command warning state governors against criticizing its handling of necessary information and certain things like that is unfortunate. So that's why Labour is thinking, look, military should not be trying to silence critics. Okay. Is that normal in the democracy? And what do you think should happen in the democracy? Is it free speech or is that how you perceive the statement from the military? 
free speech has its uh, limitations. There should be free speech, freedom of speech, but uh, it has its limitations anyway. That's just the way I say. There should okay. be a balance there, uh, yes. All right, so there you go. Balance in it. All right, so that is it. We'll look at some of the dailies here today. Uh, uh, Lena Nilo, thank you for coming on today. My so pleasure. we will be back and sink our teeth into uh, what we've got lined up for you in just a moment. Please stay with us. Protests in Mali have been growing for weeks, resulting in thousands marching through the streets calling for President Bubaka Keita to step down, despite international mediation efforts resolve a political crisis. The political unrest began after the country's top constitutional court overturned results from disputed parliamentary elections, paving the way for Keita's party to occupy a majority of the vacant seats. Disputes over the polls have also sparked post-electoral violence in several districts in the capital and other towns in March. The discontent has also been driven by economic issues and young people fleeing with rising unemployment. Even regional body ECOWAS tried to wade in, sending a delegation made up of presidents of Nigeria, Ghana, Niger, Senegal and Côte d'Ivoire to President Keita to try to negotiate and end the political crisis. The opposition, a group called M5 RFP, whose figurehead is Saudi-trained Muslim cleric Mahmoud Diko, said it would not quit the protests until President Keita steps down, raising concerns in neighboring countries of a protracted crisis. Things, however, took a swift turn late Tuesday afternoon when a group of soldiers surrounded Keita's home detaining him and top government officials. It was the most quiet coup ever. Images later posted on social media showed Keita and Prime Minister Bubu Sisse in military convoy surrounded by armed soldiers said to be at the Kati garrison. The state broadcaster went offline after the spate of detentions before coming back on air in the early evening. Confusion ensued as it was not clear who was leading the mutineers who would govern in Keita's absence or what the mutineers' motivations were. On hearing news of soldiers mutinying against the president, opposition supporters celebrated at Independence Square in Bamako. Gunfire had been heard in the morning at the army base in Kati outside of Bamako. Hours later, the confusion cleared as Keita President Keita announced his resignation in a brief address broadcast on state television. Looking tired and wearing a surgical mask, recognizing what he called the moment of truth, he thanked the people of Mali for joining him throughout the years and announced the dissolution of the National Assembly and the government. Welcome back. Well, let's take a look at what transpired there in Mali as the news broke yesterday and the case, the matter is still developing. Paul Ejima joins us now. He's an international affairs analyst from our studios in Abuja. Good morning and thank you for joining us today. Well, about this scenario in Mali, do you know, well, yes, yeah, much as uh, countries, African countries lately, try to discourage these kind of events uh, as it were, but what do you see, first of all, were you surprised that this happened because, yes, you kept tabs with it and saw some of these things developing and how it is playing out at the moment? What do you see happening? Uh, thanks for having me and uh, good morning, viewers. Uh, well, um, issue, whether there was surprise, no. I think it was uh, an accident that was... Uh, uh, waiting to happen. The recipes were there for um, 
um, something that perhaps nobody will predict, but uh, going by experience, you will know that um, this uh, should be expected. And particularly for Mali, looks like a playback of what happened um, eight years ago, 2012, if you remember. Uh, there was um, um, a, a Captain Senogo who uh, took over power from um, the, the former president, uh, Tumani Toure, over a uh, similar uh, issue and circumstance. And that was actually what happened um, that led to um, President um, um, Keita taking power after an election. The military took power for a brief um, a moment and then held an election which uh, Keita won and then um, also won re-election in 2018, uh, but um, he has not served out the second mandate. So the, 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 um, everything that uh, could um, go wrong uh, was on ground. Uh, one insecurity, uh, poverty, um, uh, allegations of um, uh, embezzlement or corruption, and then, um, you know, governance was absent uh, because um, about uh, more than 30 percent of the territory of Mali is not under the control of uh, the government in Bamako. And then um, terrorism and attacks, not limited to uh, even Mali, was extending to neighboring countries like uh, Burkina Faso, uh, Niger, uh, you know, costing lives, more than 3,000 lives. And so Northern Mali had become um, a breeding ground for uh, terrorism and um, insecurity. You have ISIS there, you have uh, Al Qaeda, and all sorts. And there also, the, um, uh, the Arabs and Tuaregs, uh, since independence of uh, Mali, have also been asking for their own independence because they feel they have been marginalized and there is no development. So that is the, 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 the scenario that um, uh, was there. And then, um, so there were immediate and uh, uh, remote causes. One of the immediate ones was the election that was conducted in March, April. Uh, very contentious and, uh, you know, fractious happening under a pand uh, pandemic. And the ruling party of um, uh, President Keita uh, did something that the opposition have uh, been against. Um, the Constitutional Court uh, had to give 31% uh, of the seats uh, to, to the ruling party, and the opposition uh, cried foul. Those were some of the issues that um, gave rise, and um, uh, you, the, the rest they say is, uh, uh, um, you know, is history. The well, you know, had to come in. Right down the screen. Now became uh, the other of the day. Exactly. So let me uh, pick up on that point. We, we, we can see some of the images on screen now happen to be protests of those in support of the move by the military. So how ECOWAS and other regions, the world, how do, they, how do you suggest they take into consideration these kind of people on the street, the protesters who are supporting it, while they react saying, no, that is unacceptable? Well, I think um, it flows from the fact that um, when ECOWAS was doing the, the, the mediation, uh, the uh, accusation was that um, they pandered so much towards um, to save um, uh, a sitting government that they didn't listen to the people. And I think that is what they are saying, that now that the military has uh, come, uh, um, uh, you know, professing to be... Um, uh, you know, uh, standing um, uh, uh, for the people. Uh, the committee they set up says it's the committee for the salvation of, uh, of the people. Well, it means maybe the people have needed salvation. So the military has offered it. So what is happening is that um, the, you needed to go down over to understand the dynamics of what was happening. I think that was the accusation they have against uh, the ECOWAS uh, uh, approach. Uh, remember, pr former President uh, Jonathan went there. After that, the five leaders had to go, which really was uh, putting the cart before the horse, before then, before a, a meeting was held. 
to now decide what's, what, what should have been done. So it should have been a meeting and then continue with the envoy issue until before you now wield uh, the big stick. Anyway, but that is now behind, uh, behind us. So what was happening was that the people felt that they have not been listened to. And that was, they have shown this by embracing the, uh, the, the military, uh, the soldiers and the military takeover. But of course, um, it, it's, it's um, usually the case. After all, I think some uh, former military leaders will tell you that uh, they acted on behalf of the people that is the civilians that, or politicians that are pushing them. But um, it's neither here nor I think there, perhaps there is the uh, feeling, <laughs> if you didn't think about uh, 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 you know, an action, there has to be the plan, conception, before it now happens. So you don't say somebody pushed you uh, to it. But that is um, as far it goes. So back to your question. Um, military rule is an aberration, can never be. I mean, that was in the past, before the, you know, the uh, wave of um, multi-party system, democracy. Now Africa should be talking about consolidation of democracy. It's not uh, fighting these uh, fires. But it becomes inevitable, given the kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, bad uh, governance, not bad government, <laughs> because government can be bad, but when you have bad governance, governance now talks about, speaks to the, the, uh, about the contracts between the, the government and the, and the people. Have, uh, who are you able to uh, keep to that contract of protecting lives and property, of uh, <laughs> respecting human rights, of um, providing the basic needs, the welfare, security, economic welfare, you know, social, uh, you know, services, the basics that makes, you know, for life. If those well, are lacking, that yeah. is what governance uh, talk, speaks to. Which but government, is what? you can get a group of people. In fact, three of us can, can form a government, but we, how do we govern? And that okay. is where governance now comes in. Now, let me, let me go back to the question that Chimelin, you know, just asked you. And let's take it this way. So on the one hand, the people are happy. There's been a military push that's pushed out, so to speak, the civilian government that's not giving them what they expect. On the other hand, is the international community saying military rule in any part of the world is no longer acceptable? Now, there is that dynamic that, of course, governments of the world, the same governments that have been complaining about the military you know, takeover in Mali now, they knew that the government of the day in Mali wasn't doing as well as it ought and that the people weren't getting the better hand of the stick, so to speak. What do you think could have been done that wasn't done before this kind of thing happened? And how do we stave it off going forward? Okay, well... Um, I think we have to approach, look at it this way. They say he, he, the person that wears the shoes, you know, feels the pinch. Um, you can visit um, from outside. So there is an internal and external factors that you need to consider. Because um, um, you cannot, uh, uh, the late Chief Abiola will say that you can't shave somebody's hair in, uh, in his absence. So you cannot uh, love somebody with all your good intentions. You have to take uh, their interest at heart, taking their interest at heart, knowing their pain, feeling their pain and how to now resolve it, diagnose it, and then offer a treatment. I think when you have um, a bad um, or faulty diagnosis, you are going to end up with um, a wrong treatment. Um, in negotiation, it's about give and take. I think the opposition, uh, that now have, you know, will, will say they have the support of uh, the people. Um, they did, I don't think anything was, uh, uh, you know, considered to them. ECOWAS came and said, listen, uh, join the uh, national government, the government of national unity, and then uh, they are, you cannot remove uh, somebody who was elected. Meanwhile, the same ECOWAS was also recommending that 31 P uh, MPs that were elected should resign. So you can see the contradiction. So this is part of um, the, 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 the problem that you have. You needed now to um, synchronize this, what is happening nationally, and then um, external 
um, interventions should um, support, should um, try to cement or solidify. But they cannot be, because they are not the ones living in, this, in, the, in the country to know what happens. You can, it's like a, obtaining a, a court um, a case against your neighbor. But you, the court, the bailiff cannot stay with you for the whole, uh, when you, for the lifetime. You have to make some peace with your neighbor so that um, they say your neighbor is your, your greatest uh, security person you should have. Speaking so about neighbors. The, the, anybody helping in, Mr. Jimmy, in, in the case in, uh, in Mali, yes. Let, let me jump in and ask you, speaking about neighbors, I mean, in West Africa still, let's switch to developments in Ghana. It's not the first time that this kind of narrative is making the rounds about Nigerians in Ghana who have complained about certain policies that the Ghanaian authorities are required of them, requested of them. Uh, now, the latest one happens to be uh, when the Nigerian shops have been locked, they say the Ghana Investment Promotion Council is asking them to provide uh, a permit or clearance, perhaps after that, they're supposed to pay a million dollars. And so reading that, it, it sounds you know, difficult to internalize that that request is actually being put out there by the authorities. Now, you also have kept an eye on that. What do you think of it? Well, it's not a new case. That is what baffles. Because and each time it comes up, something like this, some dramatic will happen, you find them, um, and then protests, and it ends there. I think that is what has, um, they have allowed the, the issue to fester. Uh, Ghana has um, what it calls a, a code, investment code that requires uh, uh, foreigners to uh, put on the ground a million dollars before you do business. And you wonder how petit traders can uh, raise that, that kind of amount. So it's not today. Uh, but, you know, uh, 2007, 2013. So it's been um, recurring. But what has happened is that there hasn't been a, 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 a resolve, both by, particularly by the Nigerian government, to, to address it. And that brings in ECOWAS. ECOWAS has, um, you know, a number of uh, rules and protocol. Once you have um, acceded to it, you have signed and ratified that, you are surrendering part of your uh, sovereignty. Some people will say, well, Ghana has a right to, to make rules and then everybody, of course. But you also must, if you are a signatory to a, a, a protocol or a convention or an instrument, you have to also concede and then abide by it. There is, you know, a disconnect between what that uh, code is saying and what the ECOWAS uh, protocols are saying on free movement, for instance, and then uh, 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 grants you the right for residence and establishment. You are now virtually treated as uh, a citizen of, of that same country. Because what it's saying, uh, if you are a, a, an ECOWAS citizen, you can move to, you know, cross to the next country and stay for up to 90 days without visa. ECOWAS boast of, the, of uh, a, a region that is, uh, you know, uh, visa-free. Right. I don't think there are others that, that do that. So that is, these are, so it don't trample on those, um, you know, fine achievements and uh, accomplishments and progress that has been made. These are some of the, but it should, it should be expected in a, in a club of uh, uh, 15 uh, member countries, you can have uh, issues, frictions like this. But it depends now on how you now address it so that, it, it, you know, it does not begin, you know, continue to uh, manifest from time to time. I think the Nigerian authorities, have, they have not uh, given sufficient uh, attention to that. And Ghana, so Ghana is now taking um, advantage of it because nothing resolute, nothing has happened. I think they Did should you put it, um, you know, uh, address it once and for all. all right, let's, a, let's... A, 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 an instrument of a national law that is uh, uh, against the, that, that of the, the region, mm -hmm. you now see how you harmonize. In fact, that's part of what ECOWAS okay. does. Okay, let, let, let's bring in Professor Amishi here. Just hang on a minute. Integration means that the, Just hang on a minute, the, Mr. Jimmy. Yeah. Let's bring in Professor Kenneth Amici, who is a chair in Business and Sustainable Development University of Edinburgh, joins us via Skype this morning from London. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. Well, I haven't heard Mr. Jimmy saying, look, we need to address this. What do you suggest? Good morning. Um, 
I, I, think, I think his points are, are clear, but one can also look at it from different perspectives. Uh, and what I see happening here is, from a political economy perspective, is a neglect of what I may call the micro entrepreneurs. And it's, I mean, he said Nigeria has not paid attention to them, and, and that's true. If you look at most of our policies, they tend to be focused on the on the big companies, big investment. Um, but what shows here clearly is that um, the micro entrepreneurs have been neglected, even by ECOWAS. So Ghana um, has the right to protect the micro entrepreneurs, and I likely may call them the informal sector guides. But in reality, they are also there for business. They they create jobs, they create opportunities, and they exploit them. And I don't see anything wrong in Ghana paying attention to that segment of society, even if Nigeria doesn't uh, pay attention to it. So uh, I think for me, um, it's a question for ECOWAS, it's a question for Ghana and Nigeria to think of how the micro entrepreneurs, the petty traders can be taken into cognizance um, in whatever we do, especially at the policy level. And it shows a blind spot in our policy making um, perspectives. Well, there, you, you've said that Ghana is making efforts to protect its own uh, micro enterprises, and that's precisely what it is. Because if you look at the, there's a law in Ghana, uh, the Ghana Investment Promotion Center Act of 2013, that says that there are certain businesses that are exclusively for Ghanaians. Uh, these are the petty trading, the, uh, the markets. You can't, you know, sell anything in the markets or, you know, can't do petty trading. You can't hawk. You can't even sell recharge cards if you're not a Ghanaian and, and you can't even operate taxi cabs and all of that. That's on the one hand. On the other hand is the ECOWAS Protocol Article 2 that says you have a right to move into these areas to, to establish businesses in any member state. Now, it would seem like this ECOWAS, this government's, this Ghana law is in direct, is at direct variance with the law of the uh, the ECOWAS protocol, how do we then begin to marry both? Um, I'm not completely. Uh, I'm not an expert when it comes to the legal um, dimensions and the technicalities. Uh, and I know that uh, lawyers are very creative, and there are opportunities to take advantage of loopholes. So I think what what matters here might be one scrutinizing that ECOWAS policy you've mentioned or regulations. I, I read somewhere that they allow for only ninety days for business transactions. Um, but one can stretch it and say, well, we are, are we not all citizens of ECOWAS? Therefore, we have uh, uh, rights as any other citizens of countries within the ECOWAS region. Um, but it could also be an oversight on, on the part of Ghana because they were talking about foreigners. But here, who are the foreigners? Are they people outside ECOWAS or are they people from other countries uh, within ECOWAS? So I think that has not been well articulated and hopefully it gives room to scrutinize um, the, the, the ECOWAS policy or regulations you, you have highlighted. But also look at it the other way around. Uh, the Ghanaians also have a right to, to protest or do whatever they are doing because Nigeria chose to, to close the borders, for example. So what Nigeria did there, how, to what extent did it fit in with the ECOWAS policies and regulations? So Nigeria can use security and other uh, reasons to, to do things in the continent, um, I mean, in, in the region. But we also need to consider other states and what they will feel about some of the policies um, we, we execute in Nigeria. So um, as a big brother to most of these countries, um, Nigeria should also lead by example. And they are there watching, and we can't continue to lord it over them. Then we, we do whatever we like, whenever we like, in relation to the ECOWAS, and then we expect others to play by the rules. I think that's the hypocrisy of, of a different order, if you ask me. But how do you say it's hypocrisy? Because, I mean, Nigerians who live in Ghana tell us that, look, they pay yearly for what they say is non-citizens identification card to access uh, in ECOWAS community. And so this is clearly against the ECOWAS protocol, what they're saying that it has to be free movement and trade. So if Africans, West Africans, are supposed to pay for this, they say, look, what's going on? So where, how does that sit? Should that even be the case? Um, I agree with the fact that the ECOWAS region, if we are to operate as an economic region, needs to be properly harmonized. And I, I don't have anything uh, uh, against that. It's like any other economic bloc in the world. Think about the e European Union. If you're a citizen of the UK, you can go to Germany and start a business and vice versa. So, But 
the point I'm making is that we can be cherry picking. Yes, Ghanaians have done this and they have done that. But we also think about um, Nigeria. You know, what have we done in Nigeria that have also gone against the ECOWAS policies? So we can, my point about hypocrisy is that we can't expect others to keep to the rules while from time to time we, we break the rules ourselves. So um, and if we sign up to ECOWAS, let's all make it work. Um, if there are um, bits and pieces to be fine-tuned, why not? They should be looked into. And the point I'm making is that we, we don't need to grandstand as if we have been keeping the rules ourselves. So, but Ghana has a right to protect their citizens. Ghana has a right to encourage micro-entrepreneurs. Um, and ECOWAS as a whole, I think, also should have paid attention to micro-entrepreneurs. And what this has revealed is that that has not been done over the years. We focus a lot more on the big businesses, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the big businesses do not exist in isolation. We also need the ecosystem. Uh, we are the uh, micro-entrepreneurs and SMEs can be carried along. And Ghana appears to be showing a lead on that. Um, it provides an opportunity for ECOWAS um, to look at that carefully and also for Nigeria to pay attention to policies that will help the petty traders. They are often not taken into consideration. They are in the you know, what we may consider our own blind spot, policy blind spot. And they are largely considered the informal economy, and that for me is a is a policy problem, not only in Ecuador but in the, in the rest of Africa. Mm. Well, Mr. Jimmy, let me bring you in on this one because uh, they say there's an international political dimension to some of this because at the moment they say. Uh, that Ghana is currently trying to sabotage Nigeria's interest of contesting for the Commissioner of Peace and Security at the African Union. So it appears as though they are coming at us in different ways now. I think we need to separate um, issues. And uh, Prof, thank you for raising uh, those issues. Uh, but I don't want us to lump, bring, um, you know, apple and um, uh, oranges together. When we are dealing, I, I like us to do some dis, uh, disaggregation here and deal with the issues as they come, not lump all of them together. If Nigeria has taken any decision that is against uh, the protocol of ECOWAS, I think you should uh, pinpoint on that and then address it and not say, well, because Nigeria has done that, so Ghana or whatever, another country. When you operate on that level, uh, you are going to get, um, you know, the issue uh, uh, mixed up. So... If, like this, um, uh, trade is coming. But, but let's also remember that much of what trade that goes on in, Af in West Africa is what you call unofficial. And so, like he, he was saying, perhaps the, the laws are, uh, you know, uh, 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 got the, those who are drafting those uh, on their bl blind side. Fine. Um, that is why there are amendments to laws, because by the time you are making such laws, perhaps you did not take everything into consideration. That is allowed. So if there is any lacuna, if there is any uh, uh, gap, I think it should be filled, but not at the expense of uh, the citizens. Right, so the authorities, the policy makers will now have to do something. There are those who are experts on, on trade. They should sit down and then if, for instance, Nigerians on their side, we raise these issues at the various, you know, uh, organs of ECOWAS, the ministerial, um, experts minutes, uh, meeting, sec sector minister, ministry, and then you get, before you get to the authority of heads of state. If you now flag them, they can be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, remember that recently that Ghana also, uh, 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 you know, modeled the waters by uh, the issue of uh, uh, bringing down uh, uh, a building that was supposed to be within uh, uh, Nigeria's uh, uh, embassy. That is an embassy is, is a territory of, uh, of, of a country. You don't joke with it. That is why you find some people taking refuge there. Things like this should be taken, addressed, you know, um, case by case, not allow them to uh, lump them because that is where the issue is. Nigeria ought to, what has happened to that now? Perhaps that case has gone. And now when the, the issue of traders have also come up, uh, very soon, two weeks, they have stopped. But without resolving that, that is the, the, the key to it. So that willingness, that uh, resolve to approach it, but particularly in Nigeria, if you feel hot on an issue, 
you have to raise it. So maybe Ghana, you will say, well, it's not uh, uh, their, their call. It is Nigeria that is complaining that you do that. But that has, you find it that it happens in so many cases that um, it's not helping the, the, um, the, the, the cause for which uh, ECOWAS was actually set up in 1975. So All right, gentlemen, time, you know, first and, and it was economic uh, development and then regional integration. It's just that uh, sec peace and security uh, overtook everything, and so Eco All right, is we, we need to go at this point, Mr. Jimmy. Uh, peacekeeping well, than let's for not even the, forget the that there's still the after part of this that uh, it's equally very important. But that's how far we can go. We thank you both, uh, Professor Kenneth Amechi and uh, Paul Ajima, international affairs expert. Thank you both for talking to us this morning. All right, we'll be back in a moment. Stay with us. Major among reason is uh, insecurity. And once the general society perceive that the atmosphere is becoming insecure for them, one of the fallout of that is to turn to government and ask government to do the needful because one of the primary function of government is to ensure security of life and property and any government who is not able to do that is not entitled to continue to remain in power but it is not by removing that government through a military push or through a violent means, is by using the ballot box to tell that uh, government to please go, to please go, you are the wrong, you are the wrong person for this job. So it's as simple as that. So it is an unfortunate development, you know, it's because it's taking Africa back again. You know, we don't want a situation where Africa will be looked at as a continent where they cannot rule themselves. A continent uh, invested with violence, war, insecurity. No. So, and this is a lesson for all uh, African leaders. Welcome back to Sunrise Daily World. We're turning our attention now to uh, local content matters. We just spoke about you know, developments in Ghana how we needed to pay attention to some other things, our blind spot, as the uh, analysts described it. Well, now we've got Mr. Simbi Wabote, who is the Executive Secretary, Nigerian Content Development and Monitoring Board. He's an engineer. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. Well, um, okay, there's some good... Morning, good uh, Chamberlain. Uh, thanks, thanks for having me. Okay, thank you. I'm um, just, um, yes, recently that 17 story building, what a statement it was really uh, for that, that structure to be right there. So it gives us uh, a lot of hope that certain things can indeed happen. Because, I mean, before local content was even talked about, who would have thought that that can be achieved when it was? So beyond just seeing that building, could you give us a picture? What kind of progress? are we making concerning local content, particularly in that sector? Yeah, th thanks uh, uh, once again, Chamberlain, and uh, thanks for having me. Um, and uh, thank you for uh, all the congratulatory messages with regards to uh, the commissioning of the 17-story uh, building uh, in Bielsa State, uh, in the Anagua, to be precise. Uh, we're very happy uh, for that achievement. Um, in the sector currently, uh, like you know, the local content uh, law itself that we have focuses on the oil and gas sector. Uh, in that sector, uh, we have made significant progress uh, from when we started in 2010. Uh, just as an example, uh, before we, uh, the Local Content Act uh, came into being, um, in 2010, uh, usually the oil and gas sector spend about $21 billion year on year on all oil and gas activities. And only about less than 5% of that uh, was domiciled in country. Everything that was done in that sector was taken out of this country. Uh, 
Uh, but today, uh, we're very happy to tell you that we are about 32% in terms of what we've been able to claw back within the short period of 10 years. You probably think 10 years is a very long time, uh, particularly when you look at the oil and gas business, which is highly technology intensive and equipment intensive. And to make that progress within that period, I think is quite significant. Uh, we've been able to establish a lot of fabrication yards uh, in the country. Uh, before 2010, uh, we were only doing less than 2,000 metric ton fabrication in the country. But as I speak to you, we are doing 60,000 metric ton fabrication in the country, in the oil and gas sector. Uh, we were also able to break a uh, record in terms of integrating the first world largest FPSO, 2,000 barrels per day production of Total in Nigeria. Uh, today, uh, Nigerians are running the business in the oil and gas sector. Uh, look at most of the companies, uh, the MDs are Nigerians. These are things you've never heard of. Uh, I joined the oil and gas industry in 1991. Uh, and as a young engineer, we were told where we could get up to. Uh, in that uh, organization, uh, which of course ended at the supervisory level as opposed to becoming a manager or a director. But I left uh, Shell uh, in 2016 as a director of that company. And today you have a Nigerian as the MD. Uh, look at your NLNG today. 95% uh, of the employees in that uh, organization are Nigerians. And today is one of the best run uh, oil and gas uh, facility in the country. So we've come a long way. Um, uh, we, we've achieved quite a lot uh, to the extent that uh, you begin to have uh, countries, uh, uh, neighboring African countries, uh, asking to learn how we've been able to uh, achieve this uh, milestone. Uh, I recall as a young man, uh, in the, even in the helicopter business, which is uh, safety critical, uh, was the exclusive preserve of the likes of Bristol helicopters and the rest. Today you have Cavatin, you have all that Nigerian providers who are even extending their services beyond the shores of Nigeria. Uh, when you look at the subsurface studies, uh, in those days all studies, subsurface studies in terms of our data, our reserves, everything was outside this country. But today, most Nigerians have set up facility to undertake subsurface uh, engineering studies and all the well servicing opportunities in the oil and gas industry are managed by Nigerians. So by every standard, we have indeed achieved a lot in moving the needle when it comes to local content in the oil and gas sector. And like you said, the 17 story building is a statement uh, saying that what we have done in that sector uh, we've been able to do it as a NCDMB in terms of building our head office. That head office was built by an indigenous contractor. Almost 75% of the materials we use are from Nigeria. 95% uh, of the workforce uh, that built that uh, building were Nigerians. As a matter of fact, when we started, we made it very clear to the contractor that all the workers you are going to use on this project must be from Nigeria, including the tilers, the machines, the carpenters. It was a challenge uh, for, for the contractor, but that's what uh, the law says. And the contractor had to take about 250 youths uh, in collaboration with ITF, train them on these skills. And those were the people that indeed built that building. And uh, we are very proud of the achievement. And like I said during the uh, commissioning by our dear president. Uh, it gives hope uh, when people look at that building uh, being the tallest uh, in the south-south and in the southeast as we speak. So it gives right. hope to a lot of people that a lot can be done yeah. in this country. Chamberlain. Already people are poking me, asking me, well, look, we hope that they can see a similar scenario with the real sector, but I told you, you're not the minister in that regard. But when you speak about how huge the kind of impact the local product uh, the local participation immediately comes to head is i mean you're an engineer yourself are institutions here what kind of, is there a relationship with them because this is a huge opportunity for them to leverage on and build capacity as well what's going on in that regard 
Um, if I get your question correctly, if you are talking about uh, our institutions, perhaps tertiary institutions and yeah. the impact, um, I don't know if that's the direction that um, uh, you're going. But I must tell you that uh, uh, with the statistics that I gave you, uh, most of us uh, are product of uh, our institutions. Uh, if I got your question correctly, uh, uh, majority of us never schooled outside this country, at least for our first degrees. Uh, so the institutions have been able to bring up uh, quality graduates, uh, as well as uh, 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 quality engineers, uh, ICT sector and the rest of it all. The only challenge that most of the uh, uh, youths have uh, when they come out of uh, those institutions are the opportunities. Uh, the opportunities, well, I manage the oil and gas sector. Uh, like you know, it's not uh, a great employer of people because of the machineries and because of the technology involved. But the uh, supply chain that it creates uh, has the potential to increase that by uh, sixfold. Uh, for every one job you create uh, directly in the oil and gas sector, you create about six of that in the supply chain that it creates. Uh, if you look at it, uh, majority of the people managing uh, those organizations today were products of Nigerian institutions. But the challenge is, like I said, uh, when those graduates come out, uh, anywhere you go, people ask for experience. Uh, we needed to create a situation where opportunity is provided the young graduates in terms of internship uh, so that they can acquire the desired experience uh, to be able to get employed uh, as at when the time comes. But that uh, challenge is a bit there. Uh, the nexus between industry and the academia I think it's not, uh, um, it's not well defined and, and there is no proper handshake between uh, uh, those uh, 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 institutions and, and, and the industry. But if we are able to uh, put a formidable strategy around that, where I, I recall in those days when I was in the university, uh, the industrial work experience uh, was one of the key things that drove that experience that is desired uh, when you come out of the university uh, because you also capture that as part of your training program. Some of us spent one year, six months in the industry to understand how it works uh, before we graduated and that gave us an edge to a large extent. But today, I don't know how formidable that industrial work experience is uh, with, within our universities and also with, with the industry, uh, Chamberlain. Well, um Definitely the local content policy hasn't been, hasn't come without its challenges, the initiatives of government and of course your office. Uh, some will also point to the fact that uh, some of the objectives, uh, incre include increasing oil and gas reserves and so many other things, increased production capacity. But perhaps the most important of these objectives would be what some would call the integration of the oil and gas industry into the mainstream economy through local refineries and petrochemicals. That's definitely a major gap, which most certainly would create a lot of uh, jobs for people if we could bring that in the, into mainstream economy. So this question seems like a two-pronged one. On the one hand, what are those challenges that the local content policy is confronting and how do we integrate that uh, success, the successes you have uh, reeled out now into mainstream? Yeah, indeed. Um, uh, well, it's not a policy. It's a local content law, uh, as it were, uh, in the oil and gas sector. It, it, it metamorphosed from policy to uh, an act. Um, it, it comes with a lot of challenges. Uh, like I said, uh, because the sector is highly technological intensive, uh, therefore, uh, developing local content is not uh, um, a, a flicker of the switch. It takes time in that sector. Uh, like I always say in, in every forum that I find myself, is that local content is not a sprint. It is a marathon. You have to build it over time. Of course, there will be a lot of resistance uh, from the international operators, including the local operators, because every businessman wants to maximize his profit. And for them, uh, introducing local content that at the beginning 
will cost them a lot a bit but towards the end they see the benefit because it does reduce cost um, they will resist it because they want to maximize that so you, we got a lot of resistance uh, from the international oil companies uh, as well as the uh, local companies um, that was a big challenge uh, the other challenge we are faced with was the dirt of infrastructure uh, in our country, uh, which of course increases cost of uh, activities within the uh, oil and gas sector. Uh, for instance, uh, you have today uh, a flourishing pipe mill uh, factory in, uh, in Abuja. And if you want to use those pipes in the south, uh, where the oil and gas activities uh, 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 operate, uh, you have to move those pipes from uh, Abuja to uh, a place like Port Harcourt. Under normal circumstance, if the roads were very good, it, it would take you perhaps eight hours uh, to get that uh, uh, truck to uh, uh, Port Harcourt. But today, with some of the challenges we face with the infrastructure, it would take you probably three days. And that, of course, increases cost. Uh, the other bit is about the energy. Uh, you need a lot of power in that sector to be able to do your fabrication and other activities. Of course, uh, because of the challenges we face with the uh, power sector, uh, that in itself has a cost that it adds to it because every contractor has to uh, install a generator, use diesel, and uh, that adds to the cost. So infrastructure challenge is there. Uh, and also capacity challenge uh, also do exist uh, in, the, in the sense that uh, because of the uh, lack of capacity in taking over uh, some of the operations in the oil and gas sector, we had to see a delayed process because you cannot just replace uh, an expat uh, 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 with a Nigerian who has not gain up the experience and who have not been trained for certain types of jobs. So there was also capacity constraint as a challenge, uh, uh, which of course we, we had to face. And bit by bit, we had to deal with those challenges and integrate that into our process. Coming back to the second part of your question, in terms of the value chain within the oil and gas sector, going back to refining uh, and, and, and scooping the benefit of the oil and gas value chain from the upstream to the downstream sector. I think uh, that has been uh, 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 very much a challenge for Nigerians. Uh, most of the refineries that you expect that you work had their challenges before now, uh, they are not working. But I think there is hope uh, in that regard. Um, I, I think the other day I heard the GMD uh, during a presentation reel out the plans to revamp uh, most of those uh, refineries. Uh, the, some of these things take time. And we in NCDMB have also collaborated with uh, investors to catalyze the process of uh, refining in our country. Uh, we've, take it, we've taken uh, equity position in some of those uh, uh, modular refineries that are being built uh, in the country. As I speak to you, our partnership with Walter Smith Refinery uh, production was supposed to start on the 1st of May, uh, but unfortunately we got caught up with the COVID challenge. But I can assure you that by mid-September, uh, production in that uh, uh, refinery will start. Uh, we have also taken a position in Azika refinery in Bialsa State. Uh, we believe that it's a hydro-skimming refinery, uh, which is a bit different from a topping plant. Uh, we believe that by uh, uh, fourth quarter 20. 22, that will also come on stream, and also with DuPont in Edo State. So there are lots of these modular refineries that we have uh, actually invested in. And like you know, the Dangote refinery is also uh, uh, accelerating its completion process. Uh, it's a six, 650,000 barrels per day production. Yes, you might say uh, we woke up uh, late to take up those challenges from the private sector, but I think we are making tremendous progress under this administration. Uh, the Minister of State for Petroleum Resources, uh, whom I report to directly, uh, is something that he holds discussions about every week. Uh, there is no week that passes that I am not called uh, to ask of progress we are making in that area in order for Nigeria to be self-sufficient in terms of uh, refining capacity. And I can assure you, Chamberlain, that between now and 2022, I think the narrative will change in terms of how we've been able to claw back benefits uh, from the uh, oil and gas uh, value chain.
And, and we're working towards that, uh, I can assure you. All right, well, talking about the possibility of uh, applying that law, the local content law, to other sectors, I don't know if you see this as a challenge. Uh, some of the things that we, some of the revelations coming out now from loans we are getting and some contracts or terms or agreements we are signing indicates that the giver, the person who is giving us the money to do our own projects, includes certain clauses that says that they have to take certain positions, execute certain things. Now, talking about the capacity development that you talked about the other time that you mentioned earlier, how do you think that helps or hurts the knowledge transfer or capacity de development initiative that this local content law uh, seeks to build? Well, I, I think there's no, uh, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer uh, when you say he who pays uh, the piper uh, dictates the tune. Uh, uh, most of these uh, 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 countries uh, that uh, grant you uh, uh, some bit of loan to undertake certain activities, of course, uh, no, there's no free lunch. It will come with some uh, uh, level of uh, conditions, as it were, especially if it is a challenge for you to uh, generate uh, such monies to take care of your infrastructure. But I think the beauty of it all is that uh, the borrowing is not being done uh, uh, for people to use it on activities or projects that will not be visible uh, to the eyes. Uh, and I think for me, this borrowing is being done to develop infrastructure in the country. Of course, no doubt that uh, uh, when they give you the loans, they will put some conditions, including some level of supply, uh, uh, including uh, uh, bringing in their personnel to work. There's, it's, it's all over the world it happens. Uh, uh, even if uh, China uh, uh, gives loan to America, they will demand the same condition. So Nigeria is not any different. But again, like I said, because local content is not a sprint, it is a marathon. Uh, some of this infrastructure that we never heard before uh, in this country, uh, probably we did have, but uh, some of us uh, never saw it work efficiently, and we want to bring such infrastructure back to our country. Of course, we need all the help on, the, in, on Earth. Uh, and like I say to people, I said, look, if there is a technology that Nigerians uh, don't have capacity for, and you have an expert firm that has that technology and that capacity, and they want to come to Nigeria in order to install that capacity under the policy of domiciliation and domestication that we drive in the oil and gas sector. Of course, for us, we will support such an establishment, but on one condition that you must give us a plan with which you will domesticate all those positions over a specific period of time. That's our strategy. But if you say, no, uh, you want Nigerians to be the ones to take total responsibility for this uh, from day one, of course, it's not going to work because the technology belongs to them. Therefore, we just develop a strategy of domiciliation. First, domicile that activity in country. Whether you like it or not, that activity has the potential to support other ancillary activities. For instance, if you bring people into the country to establish a factory, they are going to require drivers, they are going to require cooks, they are going to require uh, uh, cleaners, they are going to require uh, rent houses and the rest of it. So it supports the other uh, 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 invisible economy as it were. But with our strategy, over a period of five years, you must give us a plan where you want to build Nigerian capacity to take over those responsibilities. And that's what we have done in the oil and gas industry. That's let, why let, today you see uh, 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 most of the uh, 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 Nigerian operated assets mm -hmm. are producing much more than when it was handled by international oil companies. Let, let me jump in and ask you this. Plat. When well, plat, well, I get to just bring that example as well, because we understand that uh, from what you've said actually previously, uh, th over 30,000 direct jobs have been created as a result of implementing this particular act. Now, we've also read and seen that you've had several meetings with uh, different members of the National Assembly, how you want to, how we need to replicate this same success story on the other sectors of the economy. Now, could you talk to us about that, particularly concerning 
funding because without that funding component being addressed, I'm not sure that you'd have gotten this far because, yes, it's funded by, I think, a Nigerian Content Fund. So how do you or what kind of conversation and what kind of progress is being made to ensure that we get the same thing in other sectors? I, I think my personal opinion uh, on this matter is that uh, there are sectors that are cost centers and there are sectors that also generate income. What I mean by that is that there are certain sectors that you just keep spending money, but there are certain sectors that as you spend money, it brings money back to you, like the oil and gas sector. Uh, if we invest, we get return on investment because that is the mainstay of our economy. So if you look at other sectors, don't want to single them out here. There are some of them that have the potential to generate money if you put in money into them. Uh, for me, those are the sectors that we need to focus on in terms of extending local content. And it has to be a gradual approach. Uh, you cannot flicker the switch on local content development overnight. So I, my approach will be, look at those sectors that if you put in money, it will generate money uh, for a start of extending local content. As an example, the mining sector. There is no gain saying the mining sector has a huge potential. If you invest money, you are going to get money back. Even in your real sector, you invest money, you are going to get money back. Because what the time you begin to operate your railway lines and the rest of it, the income you generate has potential to sustain your drive for local content in those sectors. So my approach will be look at those sectors that have that potential, focus on them, and ensure that you put the same strict processes and procedures that you are put in the oil and gas sector. Probably because of the nature of our training. The oil and gas sector is a very delicate sector where you do not want to play with safety. Hence, what, what the law said is that uh, uh, you cannot do oil and gas uh, activities if you don't meet the minimum standard. If you take the same uh, position with other sectors that also generate revenue, you can potentially accumulate some fund in order to support those sectors. But if you just say it's a carte blanche and you want to do it in every other sector, just like you said, Chamberlain, you're not going to have so much progress because funding is a key enabler for the development of local content. And how do you get that funding? If you focus on sectors that don't generate that kind of revenue, all you do, you continue to bleed government income in those directions. So we need to take it one step at a time, as opposed to thinking there's a carte blanche, you want to run every sector the same way the oil and gas sector has been run. And then secondly, Chamberlain, we have a great opportunity here in those sectors that I've talked about. The COVID-19 itself has brought a lot of uh, uh, things to, to, to fall uh, with regards to the challenges we face. Look at the oil and gas sector. Despite the COVID-19, we were still operating and we were still producing at full capacity because we've been able to get Nigerians to take on those positions in other, as contractors, as staff. So we didn't feel any panic in the sector. But so many other sectors suffered because all the experts, most of them left, they were evacuated. But in the oil and gas sector, those who were evacuated had to go to their country, but that did not close the tap. We still continue to produce in the country because of our, our uh, 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 if you like, continuous effort to build capacity in that sector. I was giving you an example of Seplat. Seplat today is run by almost 98% Nigerians. When they took over that facility from Shell, which I was involved in uh, uh, when I was in Shell to sell that facility to them, it was producing about 19,000 barrels per day. But today, Seplat is doing about 75,000 barrels per day production and aiming for 100. This okay. is managed we by Nigerians because of what we have done over time. All right. Well, well that's uh, very good to hear indeed. And we do hope that we can see this in other sectors of the economy, just as you highlighted. Nigerians can do these things as they have demonstrated. So we do thank you for your time. Uh, Simbi Wabote, Executive Secretary, Nigeria Content Development and Monitoring Board. Thank you and all the best. Thank you very much, Emily. Thank you. All right. We're well, back in a moment.
Don't go away. We've got Dr. Julian Ojebo joining us today. He is the first vice president of the National Association of Resident Doctors. We do remember that uh, there's been a timeline. Governments have been meetings. Governments saying they were going to fulfill the promises made and to the doctors as a result of which the strikes were called off. So let's get to Dr. Julian now. So tell us, is all well with the NARD now? Good morning, Chamberlain, and thank you for having me. Um, I'd like to start by saying thanks to um, Dr. Stella Amaya Adedevo, who died yesterday, six years ago. Um, we should rest in peace, and we thank her for all the things she's done. Also, try to remember that um, during the outbreak of Ebola, she was at the forefront, and we do have another, epidem another pandemic, um, COVID-19. Government has made so many promises. Um, Chamberlain, you also remember 10 days ago, the Minister of Labor, Productivity and Employment did say that all um, the remunerations for six centers across Nigeria would be paid. And today is 10 days post when he said that, and um, these remunerations has not come. Um, of course, we do have to appreciate the fact that um, starting from where we did start sometime in June the 22nd, where we did decry the deplorable state of the health um, facilities all across Nigeria, both at the federal level and at the state level, we did say that we had paucities of supplies of uh, personal protective equipment. We also did have issues with the fact that we're facing a pandemic and there's currently no form of life insurances for our members. Um, yes, we would say that there's been some improvement of on the supplies of um, personal protective equipment. But I also do see at this point that it has also been epileptic. It is not um, to the level which we do expect that um, facing such a pandemic, we should have all of the facilities we need, all of the things we need. Um, also, at this point, I ask to say that this is... Um, over um, six months, over 175 days since the outbreak of um, the COVID-19 in Nigeria. And there's all we have for COVID-19 treatment isolation centers are just makeshifts. We do not have um, proper structures to say these are facilities that after the pandemic, they're going to be used as facilities for management of um, um, infectious diseases all around the country. Um, one will do expect that um, there should be some level of progress of work in specialist centers like the Infectious Disease Hospital in Lagos, like the Euro Specialist Teaching Hospital in Era Edo States. One will do expect that we're supposed to be seeing some level of um, improvement, but at this um, very moment, we still have so much to achieve, but we are hoping and praying that um, with um, more talks, with um, different stakeholders at top levels, we hope that um, we will get all that we need in no distant time. Plus, in terms of percentages, now a proper picture. How much of these promises have been fulfilled by the government? Is there anything to worry about, and to what extent? So much to worry about, Chamberlain. So much to worry about. Um, if you say, um, like I did say earlier. The health institutions in Nigeria are not just at the federal level. We also do have a lot of deplorable states, um, states in the state tertiary health institutions, as it were. Um, these provisions, like we've said, they are not, um, I'd say they're less than 40% of what we actually expect. Should we be getting up to 60%, 70%, we can now say, okay, some Eureka can actually be said. But at this very time, we can't say Eureka yet because we do have a lot to achieve. Now, remember, this is um, August. Um, <laughs> we did talk about remuneration. We are talking about remuneration for COVID inducement allowances for June. We're still talking about provisions of personal protective equipment that we start talking about in June, in August. We're also still talking about life insurances, and we don't even have life insurance um, cover every, um, in every of these um, both federal and state institutions. So we can't say we've gotten to even the 40% I just tried to give now. We are still lacking, lagging behind, and I must say there's room for improvement, but we are hoping that um, executive appointees will live up to, the, to their words and actually do exactly what we expect them to do. We're 
We're not saying do all of them. We're saying come up so that we can meet at a particular point. And so, um, yes, there's so much, so much room for improvement, and we're hoping that they will improve and um, try to sort these issues um, while they still linger. Well, uh, let's uh, back up a little, Dr. Ojebo. Um, I remember the first, in the wake of uh, this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, on May 30, your association promised, I mean, you, you threatened to go on strike uh, on, on May 30 uh, over the COVID-19 allowance uh, demands. And um, I remember that also that on the 9th of June, the House of Representatives, the Speaker of the House of Representatives met with your leadership and the two ministers of health, and uh, they were supposed to, that was supposed to address some of the main issues. And as far as the speaker was concerned, it was already done and dusted. Only for you to announce on June 15, to the chagrin of the speaker, that, you know, uh, you are going on strike. You have actually announced that you have gone on strike. The doctors have also intervened. The Minister of uh, Health also spoke. Uh, so in all of these, and then, of course, when you called off the strike on June 22, you again threatened on June 25 to go on strike again or resume the strike you suspended if things were not done. Are you saying that all the governors paid lip service, the House of Representatives paid lip service, and the, the Speaker of the House of Representatives paid lip services to all of the issues that you have listed in this demand. Uh, once again, thank you so much for these um, questions. I, I, I need to, at this point, make some clar clarifications to make you know that NERD did not embark on an industrial action for the sole purposes of remunerations. We decried the deplorable state of our health facilities. We decried the non-provision of um, um, personal protective equipment. We decried um, provisions, dilapidated state of health tertiary institutions. We also did decry the fact that um, we don't have life insurances for our members when they died. Some time ago, we did say on this um, TV channel that we've lost over 14 of our members from exposure to COVID-19 while in the course of trying to combat this disease. Now, we also do know that this is Nigeria where there are a lot of bureaucratic bottlenecks. Okay, um, so we're thinking and we're hoping that if we can surpass these bureaucratic bottlenecks, we would achieve a lot. But at this um, interim position, we do not have um, so much force and push to push across those bureaucratic bottlenecks. So we, we still have this back and forth toss and like um, we're achieving some progress today and tomorrow some bureaucratic bottleneck is holding you down and you go back 15 days from where you actually started from. So these bureaucratic bottlenecks are actually the major issues that we have at this moment. When we surpass those bottlenecks, I, I think we'll have some level of um, trust from the Nigerian doctors to, um, to the um, 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 federal and state government. I'd also make you understand that um, when we did call out some state governors, like mm -hmm. um, the governor of um, Ekiti State, the governor of Oyo State, some months later, we saw some level of improvement. The excellency from um, the governor of um, um, Ekiti State did improve on the promises he actually did make. The um, governor of Oyo State did improve on the promises, did make. Why we see some states just um, practically not even listening to the yearnings of these Nigerian doctors? And I should inform you at this time that international travels are going to be open very soon and we're going to be having so much of brain drain because we're so, not really tackling the fundamentals. Tell really us then, Dr. Julian. Um, I draw something. Pardon me, let me just bring this in. So... In light of all that yeah. you've said, is the NARD considering embarking on another strike? Chamberlain, the NARD, they are, they are not um, strike mongers. We are open to negotiations, we are open to discussions, we are open to um, top level discussions with any kid of government that cares to listen to us. Um, the gov the um, Minister for Labor did reconvene. Um, two weeks ago, we had a meeting with him. We're supposed to be reconvening today, being the 20th day of um, 
of August, we're supposed to be having another meeting with him, and we're still going to make them understand. Executive appointees of government sometimes don't really understand our problems when we try to explain them. So we keep, uh, we need to keep telling them so that they really understand where we're coming from. So we'll still be having another meeting with them today, and um, I'd say that the uh, the National Executive Council is on a recess at this moment. We shall be reconvening, but we won't be reconvening until after that meeting with the Minister of Labour. When we have that, we can now go and say, okay, um, our members, this is what we have on the table at this very time, and then we'll now be giving um, subsequent uh, in instructions from the National Executive as to what um, we should do. But for now, we're on recess, and when the recess is called off, we'll let in the, the public know exactly what our plans um, are for um, with regards to the um, industrial um, action. But for now, we're on recess, and when we come back from that recess, everybody will know what we have in store. But you say that you're not strike mongers, so uh, you, do you want people to go with the impression that the NERD is not considering going on strike, even when you let the public know what your next steps will be? Chamberlain, again, I'm just um, um, the second among equals. Um, I can't speak for the generality of the NEC members, okay? But I can tell you that we are no strike mongers. We are ready to listen to the government and get to hear the offer that they give us. Once those offers are, are tangible enough, we can tell our members that, okay, we've had some level of discussions and these are the progress we've made. And then the National Executive Council will be taking that sole decision which the Constitution lays on the National Executive Council. Mm. What are those conditions that must be met before you say you will or will not go on strike? Sorry, can you say that again? I didn't get that. What aspects of your demands must be met by who before you consider whether to or to not go on strike? Okay. Uh, when we did talk about, um, some time ago, uh, about three weeks ago, there was a, a public hearing um, on, um, from the, 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 uh, the National Assembly on um, insurance and accrual matters. We've been trying to reach out to the chairman. He's not been taking our calls. Um, and we are hoping that in that meeting today um, with the minister, we're also going to let the minister know that these are our points um, with regards to the life insurances of our members. And also to make him understand that and th this is the total number of personal protective equipment we've produced, uh, provided so far to our members. This, um, this is what we expect you to provide. And then he'll be giving us feedback as to um, those provisions. We also make him understand that 10 days ago, you did say that um, um, the hazard inducement COVID, um, for COVID would have been paid to six centers as at the 10th of this month, and that before the 17th of this month, all the other centers all around would have collected such remunerations. And at this moment, we do not have um, payments made to these um, centers, as it were. We also make um, him understand that we still have a lot of problems with our state tertiary health institutions. And when we now get some level of feedback from the government as, okay, this is what we've done in such regards. This is the number of um, personal protective equipment we've sent across all the regions in the country. Um, this is how far we've gone with regards to um, the um, life insurances for your members and other healthcare workers. We'll now say, oh, we now have um, um, such and such to um, say to our NEC members that this has been done, and they will now be taking such decision as to... Um, whether to accept such or to demand for some level of improvement from what they've actually um, said. So we're hoping that um, f following today's meeting would have so much progress and um, so that work can um, progress, you know, and all that. In addition to that, I mean, you've talked about some of the states that have responded. Others are you know, late bloomers, I say. Well, so uh, at what point will the NERD say, listen, we've had it up to here? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll put like uh, two states in into um, consideration. Um, look at the state. Look at um, like Delta State, where I come from. The governor of Delta State was exposed to COVID nineteen, and he was treated by health workers. Okay, 
Sequel to that, what happened to their remuneration? They are just normal basic salaries. They were even slashed. So if we are talking about all of these, we expect some governors that have been exposed to this COVID and has seen the um, level of work that the Nigerian healthcare workers are putting to combat um, this uh, menace, COVID-19, we think and we expect that they should um, put in so much um, into commitment, into um, welfare packages for these members that are putting their lives day and night, toiling and suffering for the better, for the good of their people. So we're calling on all those state governments to say, please, come on board, do something better, get better at what you do. Your promises are quite flimsy. We need you to um, hit the ball. Hit the ball where you're supposed to hit the ball. Don't just glide on waves. Hit the ball where you're supposed to hit them. So when we get these governors to actually... Um, do what they're supposed to do. At this point, I also have to thank the, the um, DG of the Nigerian Governors Forum and the chairman of the um, Governors Forum. They've tried to talk to all um, the governors all around the state, and we're hoping that these talks should continue because we do expect them to um, actually put so much more into the health system so that the health system can be stronger and we do not have to always um, fly people abroad, you know, for every slight illness because um, they're not done so much for your local center. So we expect them to put so much money, funding, um, research, training. We need them to do so much more. So we're expecting that they will do this. And, um, you know, in no distant time, our health system should be stronger. And we hope and pray that they will just do all of these that we uh, are demanding at this point that they should do. We're, we're trying to tell them to do their jobs, actually, you know, as it were. So we just expect them to do their jobs. Of, of the five demands that you have listed out, uh, conditions upon which you will not go on strike if they are met, four of them are for... Uh, they are concerning remuneration of one way or another, payment of allowances, uh, payments of residency training. Only one of them has to do with poor health infrastructure and funding of the healthcare system. Uh, in that light, do you want to talk to us about the kind of collaborations you are having with other healthcare workers in the value chain of medical services in Nigeria outside of doctors? Because one would expect that, I mean, if you are interested in infrastructure, health infrastructures in Nigeria, you will be speaking to those other collaborators as well. Yeah, th there's been so much um, cerebral discussions with um, other um, members of other healthcare workers unions as it were. We um, have um, good discussions with the Nigerian Association of Nurses and Midwives. We also had good discussions with the Pharmaceutical Society of Nigeria. We've also had discussions with the Joint Health um, Sector Unions. You know, we've had so much discussions as it were. I also would like to draw your attention to the fact that the COVID inducement allowances um, is not just paid to doctors alone, they're paid to all healthcare workers. Okay, um, prior to that time, there was a, um, a, 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 a discussion or um, I, I put it better than saying that there was this uh, um, roundtable discussion that had um, members from the representatives from the um, Nigerian nurses, from the pharmacists, um, the other allied um, healthcare workers. All right, it wasn't Jibon. just um, a discussion between um, the NARD we... and the NMA. No, it was a discussion that had to do with every um, healthcare right, we, um, union, as it were, we have to and we are still point. in talks, and we we will never stop talking with uh, with them because we okay. do know that that's good to, to know. A stronger, um, Dr. Julian Ojebo, position. You must have, um, this, first um, vice president with other healthcare of NARD, and it's also I've heard say, heard you say several times you're not strike mongers. You're discussing, so well, it's good to know that you're not embarking on strike anytime soon in the near future. So thank you for talking to us this morning. All right, let's go right into some of the messages that you have sent in. Well, Dr. Pamosa's uh, feedback is the first one we're taking a look at here today. He says, the main issue here is whether Ghana can enact laws which are at variance or in conflict with the ECOWAS protocols on regional trade movements. The question implicates 
two schools of thought. The first school suggests that the principle of subsidiarity exists within ECOWAS region that provides exceptions to direct applications of ECOWAS protocol. And it says the schools further argues that local circumstances must inform the nature and extent of adoption of ECOWAS protocol. There's one more. It says mm -hmm. the second school of thought argues that ECOWAS protocols on trade and movement have direct application and that citizens of member nations can exercise these rights free from national qualifications. Maybe this calls for another ECOWAS summit. Uh, this one is from Imonoka and Akhena. It says, mismanaged resources subsumed in humongous level of corruption caused the retrogression of our economy, which is responsible for indefensible Ghanaian hostilities towards Nigerian businesses. It's self-inflicted economic woes caused by the political elite. Malkwe? Well, let's we can see if we can take a few meals now. Um, I'm looking at this one. This one is from AC Mayaki. Uh, it says, Morning channels. Removing a bad leader in Africa has never happened through ballot box, and people are dying of hunger and insecurity all around Africa. That's from AC Mayaki in Ilori. Then this one from uh, Ezena. He says, Good morning. Uh, your guest, Mr. Simbi Wabote, has hit the nail on the head. He mentioned specifically the huge constraints militating against the local content development. No doubt, infrastructure development in terms of electricity and road or railway infrastructure for seamless and easy transportation remain very important in determining the extent our local content is harnessed. The architectonic edifice built by the NCDMB is invariably a bold statement. Therefore, I want to task the Executive Secretary to intensify efforts towards building strong nexus between his office and the academia, especially as he has pointed out that there is absence of formidable nexus between the labor industry and our schools. He says he'll be very happy to see refineries that are built in this country using our local engineers. I think 99.9% .9 of Nigerians will be happy as well seeing uh, wholly made local facilities, refineries, and several other infrastructure assets. So, the, you know, when we've, the, what he talked about, the refineries and petrochemicals, uh -huh. that's a huge volume of jobs in millions if we would do all those ones of course he reeled out you know a list of modular refineries that are being proposed and all of that on the one hand are just the the the, the fuels but the other things that's huge huge hmm. a list of uh, employment for many people that is a clear case of what can happen when we let the best come up absolutely occupy those positions lead and get things done. And perhaps another state testament that this is one of those sectors where that hasn't been as politicized as so many others, you know, that one would say. Because, I mean, if, I mean, you, you, you would know if uh, politics has been too much in the way, I don't know if we, if we would have been able to make the kind of um, progress. So that is a clear example of what Nigerians can do. So uh, the country can be great. We can Absolutely. do far better than where we are today. Absolutely. So I think we'll time and again, may, perhaps we may just ask them, look, if that template has worked, why exactly. shouldn't we duplicate it in every other area? So that there's so many intelligent, fantastic young people across the board, as a matter of fact, who have something to offer. I think we should make that a priority. Success stories, you know, you always want to see them every now and again. But we do thank you all for watching. That is the show today. We'll see you tomorrow. I'm Chamberlain. What's so. I'm Ayo. Makide, please do keep safe. It's still scary out there. Yes, it is. And I'm out there, Yusuf. Thank you so much for watching.